The Relic. The Relic by John Donne is the piece that we are going to be discussing here today. John Donne, a metaphysical poet. We have been doing a playlist on metaphysical poetry. I hope you've been following it. There is another playlist on romantic poetry, a third playlist with Kamaini by Jaishankar Prasad, and another playlist with women's poets. Also, we do works in Urdu and in Sanskrit. So keep following Pratyancha and subscribe to our channel and do not forget to click on the bell icon so that you get an intimation whenever we upload a new video. Today we are going to be discussing The Relic by John Donne. John Donne, like we saw his time period in the earlier video, 1572 to 1631, is a metaphysical poet. We have already discussed that metaphysical poets utilize or their basic strategy is that they use conceits. Conceit is an extreme metaphor. They try and say things in ways that are metaphorical, but like other poets use understandable metaphors. Sometimes metaphysical poets use metaphors that we find it very difficult to relate to. They relate to extremely unrelated things and talk about very implausible of, uh, sort of comparisons. This particular piece entitled The Relic, I would start to explain it to you, but firstly, let's dwell on what the word relic means. Relic means remains of a holy person. Someone who died long ago, suppose you have saved a hair or a tooth from that person and that is kept inside a church or inside a tomb and that is called a relic. So here the piece basically is speaking about something which is a body part or something which are the remains of a person who was spiritual or who was a very famous saint or who had magical, magical powers. So this is the piece that John Donne is talking about. In this video, first of all, let's talk about the theme of this poetry. There are two very important things that John Donne is doing here. One, he is attacking ritualism in religion. He is attacking what is surfacial in our religion. He is attacking the fact that uh, you know someone says something and that something travels and someone else hears it and we try and we take it as truth. And he finds it very difficult that how is it that someone tells you that oh a miracle was performed in such and such city on such and such date and therefore you believe and we also start to hanker behind meeting that saint. So these are the sort of things that he's against and he says that in society or in human civilizations it's very common that we tend to go by these things that we simply hear from one another which have no proof and sometimes no logical reasoning. There is absolutely nothing that is scientific about them and yet we end up believing in them. So in this poem first of all there is a disdain for such a sort of superficial things in religion, such a sort of superficial beliefs. The second thing what he's doing in this poem which we've seen in his other works as well, he really believes by the power of love. He really earnestly believes that two people can be in very deep love with each other. There is another work of John Donne that we have done, The Good Morrow, and there he speaks of the depth of love. So this is what also comes across very strongly in the poem, that when two people are in great love, when two people really care about each other, there is nothing more miraculous than that. And if there is a miracle in the world, it is the fact that two people end up being so deeply in love with each other. To my mind, these two poems, uh, these two themes basically comprise this wonderful poem and they make the heart of this piece. Now we shall start to see this, this lovely piece and here first of all he creates a macabre image. He starts with an image that is not very pleasant to think of. He's thinking that when he dies and is buried and his grave is read up. That happens sometimes because of paucity of land or because of some other reasons, graves are dug and then they receive another person who is uh, buried inside in this grave. And uh, he also takes a tangential joke at this that graves uh, understand from women or they believe by what women believe by that there shouldn't be one person in one bed, perhaps there should be Two. Now, one way of looking at this is that perhaps he's saying that a woman needs a companion, but there could also be a naughty implication saying that one companion wouldn't do, I would want to have more. So I leave that open here and let's start reading the piece. So the piece is The Relic. 
And the relic here uh, that I told you basically is the body part of some person who has long died and that person could be a saint or a holy person. And here he says that when my grave is dug up and uh, there would be there will be found a sort of ring or a bracelet around the bone of my hand and that bracelet would be made of the hair of my beloved. And therefore, this is the relic that the poem refers to, that I have the hair of my beloved around the bone of my wrist. And the poem starts, when my grave is broke up again, some second guests to entertain. And then in brackets, he says, for graves have learned that women head to be more than one a bed. So he says that graves have learned this lesson, that there has to be someone who will come and occupy it. And also, like I said, that there could be a naughty implication that there would be one and then there would be another and perhaps a third and there'll be more than one. So he says, when my grave is broke up again, some second guests to entertain. When you break up my grave, you dig up my remains and you make place for a second dead body in there. Then you discover me. And when you discover me, what happens? Then he starts to speak of the person who's digging the grave. And he that digs it spies a bracelet of bright hair about the bone. Will he not let us alone and think that there a loving couple lies? So when this person who is digging my grave and he finds my body and then he sees this bracelet of bright hair which is around the, the wrist bone of my hand, you know, he should leave us alone. That there is a couple who are greatly in love and he should forget about it. But what if he finds us, what would happen then? And he's imagining. Who thought that this device might be some way to make their souls at the last busy day meet at this grave and make a little stay? Here, there is a belief uh, that on judgment day, all the souls, they seek out their body parts, they become whole once again before they meet their maker. And if a lover has the body part of their lover, which is a hair in this case or a, or a a uh, bracelet made of uh, the hairs of the beloved, then what happens is that uh, when the beloved seeks out this hair or this body part, they would come and again meet this person they have been in love with and therefore the two souls would enter or meet the maker together or on judgment day they would find each other again and perhaps for a few moments get to reunite with each other. So Milton is now imagining, oh sorry, John Dunn is now imagining that uh, were uh, the grave digger find me and then he finds the stuffed of air, hair around my wrist, then he would start to think that there lies a lover who believes that on judgment day I'm going to meet my beloved once again. Now here starts John Dunn's exploration of these sort of beliefs that we have in our religious philosophies, in our mythologies, in our rituals. And now he starts to speak about it in a disdainful manner from the lines that follow. So uh, we have come to the point where the grave digger has found him and the grave digger is thinking that this hair was basically put around the wrist of this dying man so that the beloved and him might meet at judgment day. If this fall in a time or land where misdevotion doth command, then he that digs us up will bring us to the bishop and the king. If this happens, if this falls, basically if this happens in a day and a time when misdevotion is in command. There are again a couple of notions that you can extract from this word misdevotion. First, he has a lot of disdain for such sort of religious beliefs that tell you about things that you might meet again in another birth or that speak of reincarnation. He doesn't seem to believe in these sort of things. The second thing that comes about is that, which I do not really agree with, but some people try to see this meaning here, that when you don't really believe in God, but you believe in love to be your God, and when that sort of belief prevails, and if you chance upon a grave with a person who has a relic of the beloved, then you would treat them as saints. So, in my opinion, it's basically to say that this is the day and time when people believe in saints, people believe in relics, people believe in sort of things where magical things can happen if you have a relic. And this sort of thing does not go 
well with John Dunn. He is not very convinced that one should have a belief in such sort of practices. So he says that suppose the grave digger believes in all these sort of things, he would perhaps find us and then quickly rush to the bishop or the king. So either he'll go to the church or he'll go to the monarch and he would tell them that listen I have found this and perhaps these guys were saints. His wife and him were of a saintly order and you must really then start to believe by them, start to treat them as saints. And then that digs us up, will bring us to the bishop and the king to make us relics. So he said we would be made living relics and they would think they have chanced upon the grave of some great saint and the saint was a great relic. And then thou shalt be Mary Magdalene and I a something else thereby. Mary Magdalene, of course, comes from the life of Christ. This is a reference to the life of Jesus Christ. And he says that like there are stories about how Jesus had perhaps a female friend, a female companion, Mary Magdalene, and therefore you shall be given an order as high as that. So institutionalized religion comes into the picture, into the poem, and he's saying that once they find a relic, and since this is a time of misdevotion, where they believe in all such things, they would treat you something of the order of Mary Magdalene, and I would be something else thereby. He doesn't use the word Jesus for himself, but basically he feels that a culture like this would start to quickly believe in such things and say, oh, here lies a saint, and then he had a companion who he was very much in love with, and therefore he has a relic of her on his wrist. So this would this would go on. And if you think times haven't changed much even today, the country that we live in, India, sometimes someone would tell you, oh, there is such and such idol in a temple, and that's drinking milk. Or someone would come and tell you that a child is has come to a temple or to a precinct, and he says that he had been here some 70 years back, when he was a young man, but he was murdered at this point. Now these sort of things, one takes them with a pinch of salt. One really doesn't know whether to completely believe them. I wouldn't decry it, but the point is that the poet here is saying that if a culture believes too much in these things, then it is misdevotion. And here he says that if they find something like this, then they will give you a name of a goddess and me they will treat like a god or a saint and then a cult would start and all sort of practices would then multiply. And we'd be given this respect in society and one person would start to respect us, the other also. And these sort of things would lead to a lot of misdevotion. This is the word that he uses here, the devotion that should not be done or it's mistaken for true devotion. Look at the lines that follow. All women shall adore us and some men. And since at such time miracles are sought, I would have that age by this paper taught what miracles we harmless lovers wrought. Now comes the turning point in the poem. He says here that once saints are made out of us, once people start to believe that some people with great spiritual prowess were here, so let's start to follow them, let's make gods out of them, let's make a monument for them, and let's make a cult in their, in their worship, and therefore in the entire society and institutionalized religion starts to come into being. So he says that all women shall adore us and some men. So he's basically trying to put forth the point that women fall for these things more than men do, but men also do fall for such things. So women surely would adore us and maybe some men. And this is uh, basically his disdain is so deep that he feels that a culture which is very insecure would look for such miracles. I'm reminded of a Ghalid couplet here, which he writes in his seminal work, Bazi Chai Atfal Hiduniya Mere Aage. In that couplet, there is, in that, in that verse, there is a couplet which says that Ik khel hai orange sulema mere nazdeek, ik baat hai ajaze masiha mere aage. Orange sulema, the throne of the king Solomon. He says, yeah, okay, kings come and go. It is not the end of the world that someone is, is thrown upon a kingdom. It is not a big deal. You tell me that so-and-so was a Masiha and therefore he performed a miracle. Well, I think this is all what people say and people hear. It is not something that should be taken very seriously. Who's seen it and who can prove it that this actually happened? So he says, I'm an evolved soul. This world is like a garden of children. 
in front of me and I'm the one who knows the truth of this world and I feel as if all these people are into some child's play in this huge garden therefore I see their truth and therefore I feel that all this thing about a king being sitting on a throne or a king ruling a kingdom these are temporary these times come and they go kings come and kings lose their kingdoms and they go away and the fact that someone performed a miracle or someone is a masiha is also something one should take with a pinch of salt ek khel hai aurange sulema mere nazdeek ek baat hai ijaz e masiha mere aake and he says i don't treat this thing these things very seriously and john dunn here is also saying the same thing and then the poem turns he says that this is a culture or this is the time that space and time where where the grave digger has found the grave that they are really looking for miracles they are so down and out as a culture they are so insecure that they are looking for miracles to redeem them and if they are looking for a miracle then i would want to teach a miracle to that age and how will i teach it through this page that i write look at the line that he writes and since at such times miracles are sought these people are seeking a miracle they want a miracle i would have that age by this paper taught by this paper that i write i would teach that age what miracles we harmless lovers wrought that the miracle is that two of us were madly in love and whatever we did together was a great miracle and he uses the word here harmless which basically is a simple word to use he's saying that when lovers fall in love with each other they mean no ill to anybody in this world and they are rather harmless creatures they're soft people who are in love with each other but this also has a relationship to the lines that would follow and i would like to bring out that theme here as well and that theme is homosexuality he would speak of the fact that uh, we were in a love where even the gender did not matter and since such people were under attack in many societies over the world at many points in human history they still are so he's saying that do not attack us or you did wrong in attacking us because we were the most harmless sort of people here you're looking for miracles in a grave with a relic and the real miracle is what lovers can bring about the real miracle is what lovers can create with the beautiful companionship the depth of relationship that they live and they practice and they manifest so here he is basically turning the poem on its head up to now he was speaking in disdain about this religion and now this word harmless in this line basically denotes that there must have been a time where he must have felt that certain kinds of love weren't accorded that much respect in society and these loves were attacked so he's telling the people that we were the most harmless lovers in attacking us you basically lost your chance of understanding what a true miracle is and you're looking for these false miracles in graves with relics this is not to be done first we loved well and faithfully and then he starts to talk of the miracle now this is the conceit in this poem that he equates love to basically a miracle that a masiha brings about and if you ask me personally i do not even think that it's a conceit because love is a miracle it's the most beautiful feeling in the world and it's a very rare feeling you have to be blessed if you find true love so it is a miracle and therefore not a conceit but in the poem this is the conceit that he has employed that he treats that when two people fall in love with each other the depth can be so much that it can even surpass the miracle a saint can perform first we loved well and faithfully and that's miraculous it's rare to find people who love well and who love faithfully yet no not what we loved nor why yet knew not what we loved nor why difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do first we loved well and faithfully yet knew not what we loved nor why difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do he believes that like angels or like people who are truly godly and nature it never ever says that do not fall in love with another individual because there is a difference of caste or gender or creed or any sort of things so guardian angels also believed in the love that we believed in and the second line basically yet knew not what we loved nor why is basically saying that you fall in love with the person but if someone asks you you cannot really sum it up in a few words why do i love that person 
Love is a complex emotion and it's difficult to say why you love someone or why you don't love them. It is basically that I love him or I love her and that's the end of story. So he basically here is indicating that even if people of the same gender were in love, it wasn't really something to be commented upon. Even guardian angels, even nature thinks that this is absolutely all right. Coming and going, we perchance might kiss, but not between those, mil those meals. Coming and going, we perchance might kiss, but not between those meals. He is saying that we did not get a lot of opportunity to explore our love physically. So perchance we got to kiss, but not between meals. This could be a reference to the fact that we were not allowed to share a home. We were not a part of the same residential setup that you and I could have lived as, as two companions under the same roof, sharing our meals and thereby sharing the space and allowing physical love to proffer between the two of us. We could not do that between our meals and we perchance kissed. Also, this could be a reference to the supper that Jesus had because there was an earlier reference to Mary Magdalene and to Jesus. But I largely think he's trying to say that there, is, uh, there was very little opportunity for us to live like normal people in love do. Our hands never touch the seals which nature, injured by late law, sets free. Complex line to write. Basic meaning is that we did not believe in the restrictions that societies and courts of law they impose upon people. Rather, we lived by the natural law. So our hands were set free. We did not touch those seals. We did not feel that we had to, we had to really register our love, get it stamped and get a document to say that these two people are in love and need to live together. No. By natural law, we were united and that was a much a greater affirmation of our love than any legal document can provide. And the word here, uh, the phrase here he uses is nature injured by late law. Things start to happen naturally. Human societies rise to the natural order very slowly. Laws are made very late in the day that actually should have been made much earlier and a lot of repression could have been avoided. For example, abolition of slavery was a law that was implemented much late in the day when a lot of slavery had occurred. Or the right to vote to women was given much later in the day in many countries when a lot of time had elapsed when women could have had that right and naturally they deserved so. They're one half of the human population and they deserve the right to education, they deserve the right to equal life and they deserve the right to vote. So though things are very natural, very evident, but before human societies accept them, it is very late in the day. So he says, we were not bound by any of these late laws. We did not need a seal or a stamp or a legal document to say or to basically give our love some sort of affirmation. We never needed it from anyone. Our affirmation was natural. It was from the guardian angels, from the God Almighty himself. You loved me and I loved you. And we loved well, we loved faithfully. This was the greatest miracle that could have ever happened and this is the miracle that we can teach these people who are seeking for stupid and surficial miracles in these graves or in these in these relics so institutionalized religion is hugely being attacked here and he's also saying that societies do not allow certain kinds of love to proffer because they feel they're unnatural but you and i we did not need the stamp of society we did not need any validation our natural depth of love for each other was our true validation our hands never touched the seals which nature injured by late law sets free these miracles we did but now alas all measure and all language I should pass. Should I tell what a miracle she was? And he says that all measure and all language I should pass. In no language, in no words, by no measure, I will be able to ever tell you what a wonder my beloved was. What a woman she was. And he uses the word she here. And again, I would think that the preceding line says, all measure and all language I should pass, should I tell what a miracle she was. He purposefully uses the pronoun she, though he's referring to a he, because he feels that no matter 
whatever the depth of his language, whatever the way he tries to tell you, whatever the measuring words he uses to quantify that he was very much in love with her, he was too much in love with her, he loved her very deeply, he still would not be able to get his point across. And in the last line, he just changes it completely and says, should I tell what a miracle she was? So he says, okay, I'm talking of a beloved, a woman that I've been in love with, and therefore, do not you take out some meanings from the lines earlier that you did. Now, there is a good chance that he was in love with a woman and he has written about this, this piece and where he says difference of sex we knew not. There is a possibility that the woman in his life understood that he had lovers of the male sex as well. That is also a possible meaning from this poem. But basically, he's saying whatever the gender, if two people are in love with each other and they're, love, and they're in love with each other very, very deeply, then there is absolutely nothing unnatural about it. It is very naturally that they feel attracted to each other and they don't need any validation. So do not be confused with the pronoun she in the last line. There is a good possibility that his beloved was a girl. There was a good possibility it was a boy. That is not the debate here. The point here, the theme here is that we should not go by what is totally accepted in the society because society comes to make these laws much later. They accept much in time. If naturally by the force of nature within you, you feel that there is someone that you can love very faithfully and very deeply, well, that is your truth and you should follow it. And also, like I said, that um, he here is saying that uh, it is very difficult to explain this to people who believe by miracles or who believe by such things that were so insecure that they're awaiting for miracles to happen, then it's very difficult to explain to them the depth of this love. And I don't have any measure, any language by way of which I could do this. And therefore, I could end by saying that should I tell what a miracle she was, that my beloved was a very, very big miracle. So the conceit here is that love is a miracle and a miracle basically is something with it which a saint or a godhead performs. And here he starts to speak of a grave and of the relic of his beloved's hair around his, around his wrist and everything starts to build up from there in the end to come to the conclusion that do not look for such sufficient miracles being in deep love is the only miracle in the world and let us teach this to the world by this poem, this paper that I write. And my beloved was very special and was a miracle. John Dunn and this is the beautiful piece we discussed by him, The Relic. Please keep following the playlist on the channel. I would come to you with another video very soon. Thank you.